Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay. For someone who's not very prepared, and that's me that I'm talking about, I just have to let you know, Forrest, you need to pay attention. I came prepared because I thought Forrest was going to do some jokes. So I had a couple of jokes for you to go against Forrest jokes. So you're just going to get my jokes this morning. So here we go. What do you call a running turkey? Fast food. Oh, I know. It gets better, I promise. What sound does a turkey phone make? Wing, wing. I know. And last, I won't bore you with too many. Here's my last one, which is really my favorite. Why did the turkey cross the road? Any, any guesses? It was the chicken's day off. I, I really, seriously, I, I do like that one. Okay, so today we are celebrating Thanksgiving, a time that we gather with family and friends to offer up those blessings, to eat some turkey, to get stuff, and to begin the holiday season. But more importantly, what Thanksgiving is really about, it's a time to stop, stop our busyness, and be filled with gratitude, deep gratitude. I love this story from Luke because it gives us a glimpse of what gratitude looks like. In the section that we read from this morning, you know it's chapter 17, so you know we're getting closer and closer as Jesus goes to Jerusalem. We know what happens there. It is a time that with Jesus is with his disciples to help mentor them on their journey before he's gone. So he's teaching them as they go along. Luke tells us that they are somewhere between Samaria and Galilee now. This is important. It's a fact that is not insignificant. Luke wants us to know specifically what region they are in. It would have raised a red flag because a good observant Jew did not go anywhere near Samaria or would have anything to do with Samaritans. Remember, the Samaritans were the social and religious outcasts. They were a despised group of people, culturally and theologically considered to be inferior. Just the mention of them would have gotten the attention of those that Jesus addressed, and not in a good way. As Jesus' and disciples get near the village, ten men come out and meet him and call out to him. Keeping their distance because they are lepers, that means they have some kind of form of skin disease, and therefore they were quarantined and kept away from everyone else. They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This captures Jesus' attention, and he stops. And in the message, it says, which I love that, he stops and he takes a good look at them. Takes a good look at them. He gets their attention and Jesus stops and he looks at them. And he notices who they are and where they are. He sees what they look like. He sees them really sees them, and he understands, and he grasps the predicament, and he emphasizes with their agony. And in some way, I think he validates their humanity, their worthiness, and at that instant, he chooses to heal them, and he sends them off to the priest. Now, it hasn't said that they've been healed. It is as they go that they find out that they have been healed. And on the way, one of the lepers, realizing what has happened, that they have been healed, turns around and with gratitude, instead of following Jesus' instruction, races back to Jesus, throws himself at Jesus' feet, and starts loudly proclaiming and shouting God's praises. It's a constant barrage of thank you, expressing his deep joy and gratitude for what Jesus has done. I've thought about this scene, as you might expect um, or think about it. Can you imagine Jesus there and this man coming and just throwing himself at his feet? 
It's one of those kind of moments, a happy moment, and I thought it was something you might expect to see on the Hallmark Channel. But then Jesus goes and ruins the moment with five simple words. So far, we're really good. People are listening. They're all into it. And then Jesus says, he was a Samaritan. The outsider, the despised one, the socially outcast, is the only one out of ten that recognized the depth and breadth of the gift bestowed upon him on them. Not the Jewish men, but the Samaritan. The Samaritan somehow gets it. He understands that what Jesus has offered is more than just a healing of his disease. Jesus says to the Samaritan, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. John Buchanan writes this about that. He says, was there something about this man that was more well, healthier than the other nine? Apparently. Does his gratitude have something to do with his faith? Apparently. I want to say that again. He asks the question, does his gratitude have something to do with his faith? apparently. And then Buchanan goes on to say that surely by Jesus' definition, faith and gratitude are very closely related, that faith without gratitude is not faith at all, and there is something life-giving about gratitude. I find that sometimes that I can dwell on all the problems in the world, and so the other day, I was in, in books, um, Barnes & Noble getting a book, and I came across a book called Everyday Gratitude. It's a wonderful little book. I don't know if you've seen it. Not only does it have wonderful things in it, but it's colorful as well, so it makes me happy when I read it. So each morning, I start off reading one of the pages, and each evening, I read a page. There is something life-giving about gratitude it is that the heart beating reminds us that to take notice of the abundant gifts, the blessing of God, and how richly we have been showered with so many good gifts. Gratitude thanksgiving is a conscious recounting of the blessings God has given us as a deliberate act of recognizing God's work in our lives. Someone recently told a story, and it might have been at Presbytery, um, about how they were to go and think of a hundred different things that they were grateful for. And it was with a group of children, and they didn't think that they could think of a hundred different things that they were grateful for in that day. And when they started, boy, they had more than a hundred. Gratitude is life-giving. It is God who gives us life and breath. It is God who bestows blessings upon us. And that's what the Samaritan understood. Lynn Babb, a Presbyterian minister and writer, explains how gratitude is a spiritual discipline. She writes this. About a dozen years ago, my husband and I decided to make a change in the way that we prayed together. At that point, we had been married about 15 years, and we had fallen to a pattern of praying together once or twice a week. When we prayed together, our prayers focused mainly on the stresses of our lives. Our two sons were entering their teenage years, and the transitions from adolescence was sometimes painful and bewildering. My husband was experiencing increasing frustration and isolation at his job. I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was a seminary graduate, but did I not feel ready to serve as a pastor? We knew it was good to turn to God with our needs, but often after praying together, we felt more depressed than when we had before we started. Just focusing on all those needs, even in prayer, was overwhelming. We felt stuck in a rut of discouragement and negativity and powerlessness. So we decided to make a small change. We began each prayer time with a few prayers of thankfulness. At first, the most we could come up with prayer life was thanking ye for making it through the day, 
or thanks for helping us survive that argument with our son. But week after week, as we consciously look for things for which to thank God, we began to notice more blessings. We began to thank God for the food on our table, for our home, for the love we had always had for each other, for those good moments that we had with our sons, for our church, our friends, for the flowers at springtime, the blue skies of the summer, the joy of exercising. As the years went by, we began to notice even smaller things that we were thankful for. A hug, a touch, a delicious meal, the wind in the trees, a break of sunshine after a long rainy spell. Over the years, I found that my own personal prayers were changing. I was much more likely to thank God for the blessings in my life. In fact, I began to notice them even more. There's all sorts of research about what gratitude does for you. It makes you healthier. It makes you happier. People who are grateful live longer, are less stressed, are able to see the beauty around them even when that dark cloud wants to come. When we intentionally practice gratitude, let me tell you, your life will change. When we intentionally practice gratitude, our focus shifts and we were able to see abundance and not want. We are filled with hope and not despair. The smallest things will bring us pleasure, and our cups will overflow. Being grateful changes what we see, who we see, and who we are. Gratitude and thanksgiving moves us beyond the standard, the acceptable, the ordinary. A gracious attitude and lifestyle makes our life extraordinary, beautiful, unusual, and blessed. So as I close, let me read today what my little saying came up with gratitude. To speak gratitude is courteous and pleasant. To enact gratitude is generous and noble. But to live gratitude is to touch heaven. May you touch heaven in your life. Amen. Let us pray. O gracious and holy Lord, we do indeed give you thanks for all that you have given us. We do indeed give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the opportunities that await us. We give you thanks for the miracles, those aha moments. We give you thanks for your grace and peace and mercy, forgiveness and love. We give you a thanks for the abundance that we have been blessed with. In your son's name do we pray. Amen.